Amen. Amen. Thanks, Hannah. Come on, who's ready for the word this morning? Amen. Well, man, we are so excited that you're here. And for every single person under the sound of my voice, we are just blessed that you're part of our church. Maybe you are a new guest with us this morning. Maybe this is your first service. We want to say a special welcome. But we also want to uh, say a special welcome to every single person tuned in online, watching by way of Facebook and YouTube. That's right. We're streaming still. And let's welcome our online audience. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Amen. I want to remind you, if you are new, that you simply were not created to do life alone. And so uh, ultimately, church was purposed. In fact, God built the church uh, so that we would do life together. And you were built from community, for community, for the purpose of community. And we believe we're better together. So we want to say welcome to the church family this morning. Excited for you to engage with us today. Um, I have a message just like burning in my heart. And I'm just, I'm so excited. This always happens, right? When I, I take a Sunday off, uh, I just come back and I'm so fired up and uh, I'm pumped. I preached 10 sermons last week. Uh, and uh, I, I thought I was going to be like preached out, and it's like the opposite. I'm like full, filled, ready to go, and I believe this word's going to encourage your hearts. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to spend most of our time in Romans chapter 8. You can turn there with me. You can go there on your phone as well. I want to encourage you to read along. You can also uh, engage with us online. Uh, go to the Bible app or, app or BibleGateway.com if you want to tune in with us there. Um, this is an interesting piece of text. But I want to start with this uh, statement, and I'm going to be making many declarations and statements today. Um, God made you to be a conqueror. Are you with me, church? God made you to be a conqueror. In fact, Paul is going to point us to a truth that we are actually more than conquerors, which is to say God created you and built you in such a way to live a victorious life. What is God's plan A for you as a person of the throne, as a child, a son, or a daughter of the Most High God, for you to walk in victory? And, and, and why I think we need to be reminded of this today is because sometimes we need to remember and be reminded of things that we already know, things that we've already been told. And so I, I want to remind us of that today. And I believe the things that we're going to be declaring and this truth that we're going to be declaring is hopefully going to allow us to do the same today. Romans chapter 8 is such a fascinating piece of text. And, and as Paul is writing, Romans 7, 8, and 9 are like the Mount Everest of just theological depth. And, but what's so interesting about 8 is you see so many different pieces of coffee cup Christianity verses within this text. One of my favorite is probably the, uh, in verse one, right off the bat. This uh, is scripture is one that has been like a warm blanket for my soul through my entire life. And if you've ever been someone that struggled with the thought of hell or, or, or maybe not being a Christian good enough or that maybe that God abandoned you, man, eight, uh, ch uh, chapter eight, verse one should be an encouragement to your soul. It starts this way. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We celebrate that today. Let's go ahead and drop down to verse 28. Here's another uh, great part of chapter 28 as Paul is looking to encourage us, the church, even thousands of years later. In verse 28, it says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If we peel back the layers of translation into the original language with the word all, you want to know what that word means? All. All. Which means what? All the things, not just the good, not just the things we celebrate, not just the things that we like about ourselves, but even the terrible things, the toxic things, the vile things. God is going to work things in such a way, just like that last song that we sung, for our good, for our victory. And we celebrate that. We move just a verse ahead in verse 29. Here's another very popular piece of text. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn 
born among many brothers and sisters. Now, some of us get nervous about that idea of being predestined. Some of us, maybe you've heard that phrase around church and it makes you nervous. And some of you, maybe you don't even like that phrase because it's like, that means like God chooses some for destruction and some for eternal life. And I don't like that. And that kind of makes the God the author of evil. But the original language, that word predestined, just means to determine beforehand. That shouldn't make you nervous. This is giving us recognition that the God of the universe knows everything. He knows everything in every single circumstance. He knows everything that we could do given any set of circumstances because he's God. And because God knows, God knows the moment that we're going to say yes to him. In fact, God set things up in such a way where he knew we were going to say yes to him, which makes God good. And so in that sense, we are predestined. And this God of the universe knows the destiny for us. Now, what is God's destiny for every believer? To make you into the image of the Son. To make you more like Jesus. And as we move forward to verse 30, 31, 32 today, I believe, and I I just want to say this, I believe I'm on a mission from the God of heaven. I believe I'm on a mission today, a heavenly mission. I have a mandate today, and that is, this is what I felt God press in my heart to help people know what they may struggle to feel. To help people know in the deepest part of their life and their heart what they may struggle to feel, right? Because there's a difference between knowing and feeling. If you know something at the deepest part of your being, it doesn't matter what you're feeling. Right, this is what was a real early uh, struggle in uh, my relationship with my wife, Cece and I, who's uh, my Caucasian queen over here, uh, rocking the computer and the slides. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this was like a struggle early in our marriage because I was always doubting and I would always wrestled with and struggled with this idea. Like I knew she said she loved me, but I would always question it. And I was looking for ways and I was always looking for evidence early on in our relationship to see how that wasn't true. And so I I didn't know it in the deepest part of who I was. So this was a problem because then when I didn't feel it, we had a massive problem on our hands because I didn't know it and I didn't feel it. But you see, eventually we got close enough and eventually we were married long enough where I knew that at the deepest part of who I was. So even when we weren't feeling the warm fuzzies in every single moment of our marriage, it didn't matter because I knew that I knew that I knew exactly what the truth was, exactly how I felt and exactly how she felt. Can I tell you, the same is true in walking in victory in your relationship with Jesus. That if you can know these truths we're going to be talking about today, at the deepest part of your being, at the deepest part of who you are, then it won't matter even in the moments where you're not feeling close to God. Because you'll know who you are in Christ. This is my aim today. This is my goal. The truth is, some of us have tried to live as a conqueror. Some of us have tried to live a life of victory. But ultimately, we live understanding that your past has been defined by defeat. Maybe your past today has been defined by defeat. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm talking about that there is a part of your life where you feel like you're on a hamster wheel. You ever feel that? Like you're on a hamster wheel. You're putting in all this effort, but you're not really getting anywhere. You're putting in all this effort at home. You're putting in all this effort in your walk with Christ. You're putting in all this effort in your marriage, but you don't seem to have any forward progress. Maybe it's that habitual sin that you keep going back to, that you can't seem to beat, that mindset that you're letting drive your emotions, the anger emotion that you keep slipping into and letting drive you. You feel like if you were maybe even on a, on a, playing a sports game that you would be definitely down on the scoreboard. Listen, being defined by defeat, if you're defined by defeat long enough, there is one distinct outcome. And this outcome comes because as we define ourselves by defeat, it actually rewires our way of thinking, our way of viewing God, and even our way of seeing the world. I can't tell you how many different people I've talked to where they've been defined by defeat long enough, they actually start to believe, watch this, that they're destined for defeat. They're defined, the defeat defines them long enough to, then they actually believe that they are destined for defeat. This is people that would say like, well, I guess it's just not my lot in life. Well, I can't expect good things in this area. I can't expect a, a happy, peaceful family or a peaceful marriage. I can't expect a rich, loving marriage. Why? Because I've done too much. I've seen too much. I've experienced too much. See, this is what I used to struggle with. Like, have you ever had a pet peeve? but about yourself, how you used to be? Anybody? 
okay. Like, I have pet peeves, but then I'll get, I'm like, man, I don't like when people are like this. I'm like, oh, wait, I don't like that because I used to be like that. I'm like looking for other people, and it was like, this is how I was like two years ago, three years ago, whatever. But so this was like my pet peeve years and years ago. Like, I would talk about when things were going good in my life and when God was doing things, I would talk about the good things in my life only in the context of about, uh, of about how I was about to lose those things. Right. So I would talk about, yeah, God's doing all this stuff. Yeah, but it's probably not going to last. Yeah, but it's probably it's, 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 it's only going to go so long. It's only going to go. I'm probably going to lose it all. No, I'm probably not going to get the job. No, I probably someone will they'll probably find someone else. I'll probably get demoted. Like, like I'll, oh, I would only ever do that. And if that's you today, if you're a person that would wrestle and struggle with this, and, and rather than living in victory, you're living in this idea that, that because there is a risk that you might lose something, that you start from a negative. I'm going to start from a negative. So then if the worst happens, it will sting less or it will hurt less. And if you are someone that wrestles with that today, I believe that the spirit of God, the word of God, the presence of God is here with us in our midst and wants to rewire our way of thinking about victory that, again, you were created to walk in, that you were created to experience. And so, man, let's pray and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the word of God. Would you bow your heads with me, church? Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for every single man and woman under the sound of my voice. And I, I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would open up your word to us. I pray this every single week. God, we, we open up our hearts and minds and lives to you today. And I know there is a rewiring that needs to take place, a reworking of our way of processing things. You created us for victory. So what does that mean? God, teach us. We need you to teach us. We need the spirit to teach us. Why? Because I am just a broken, imperfect man. So we need your presence that's here today to speak to every single heart, myself included. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. So let's dive into the word. Let's see what Paul would have to say to us starting at verse 31. He says this, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? Now, now, right off the bat, what Paul is speaking about is he's saying everything else he said up until this point in this chapter. So as we're thinking about this, he's saying, what should we say in response to the fact that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for that we know that, um, that there's good for those who are, love him and are called according to his purpose, and that God foreknew us. Another part of Romans 8 says that the Spirit intercedes for us um, and, and speaks to us us and speaks through us. He says, in light of all these things, what should be our response? And then he says this, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all. How, we, uh, how will he not also, along with graciously giving us all things, who will bring any charge, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns. No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are, say it with me, more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will, ab will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word today. I have four points this morning, and I don't like calling them points. I have four declarations. Here's why I don't like calling them points. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes when you give points and sometimes when preachers give points, it's almost like it's like a sequential list. Like, hey, do this list of things, seven steps to a better. It feels very like Tony Robbins self-helpy, right? Um, the truth is I have some declarations that we're going to be pulling right from Scripture that I believe when we apply to our life can literally change everything about your day, can literally radically change your life. I believe these statements that we're going to be talking about are ones that we need to begin the discipline of actually declaring out loud. And I mean that. I mean it when I say it with every fiber of my being, that there are certain things that we need to declare out loud. 
Now, there, there are very few things my wife and I theologically disagree on, but this is one of them. I believe, I truly believe that there is power in the words you say. That there is power in the words you say. In fact, uh, verse 31, it says this. What then shall we say, Paul says, in response to these things? So we know all of this truth about how to walk in victory, but now what should be our response? What should we say? What is Paul saying? What should my declaration be? See, sometimes when you feel defined by defeat, you have to say some things out loud that's different than the things rolling on in your head. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Now, why? Because your words have power. In fact, Proverbs 18 says, um, in the tongue is the power of life and death. There is power in the words you say. I don't know if you knew this, but um, it, it, when I was uh, finishing my degree, I learned about something um, in theology called the, um, the power of first mention, the rule of first mention. In other words, when something is first mentioned in the Bible, especially if it's a repeated theme, you have to take special note of it. So let's go back to when words were first used in the book of Genesis. Let's go all the way back to creation. Did you know that in the beginning of the very universe, words weren't used to communicate? Words were used to create. Words were not used to communicate. No, 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 no. Words were used to create. It wasn't about communication. It was about creation. God spoke. In Genesis 1, let there be light. And what showed up? Light. There's power in the words we say. This is why this theme is repeated. We see in James, the Bible says the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil amongst the body, that it can send one's whole life ablaze and is itself set on fire by hell. Friend, there's power in the words you say. This is why many of us have memories of years ago, something someone said that we didn't even care about. We didn't even care about that person at all. We didn't, we didn't care about anything about them. We have no history with them. We have no relationship with them. And yet the words that they said still haunt us to this day. It still affects the way that we process, the way that we see the world, the way that we move and groove in this life. Why? Because there is power in the words you say. There is a power to bludgeon to death or to build you up. And Paul is reminding us, hey, use your words. What should we say then? Use these words. Use this declaration every single day in an environment that could breed life. So here is the first declaration. Now, these aren't John's declarations. Don't be thinking like, I don't want to start declaring things over my life that some pastor came up with. These aren't my declarations, y'all. Just relax, okay? This is straight from the word of God, okay? Number one, first declaration. God is for me. God is for me. Verse 31b says this, if God is for us, who could be against us? Come on, turn to your neighbor. Tell him, God is for me. Now turn to your second choice that you were nervous to talk to the first time. Tell him, God is for you. God is for us. Now this is a rhetorical, rhetorical question. If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a rhetorical question, of course, that Paul is asking. But we need to return this rhetorical question into a reality and a truth for our souls. And so if God is really on our side, is there really anything that we can't face? Like, let, let, me, let me build it this way. Okay, so I don't normally do this, but I'm going to get some crowd participation. So I don't know if there's any, uh, any professional basketball uh, uh, fans in the room, but I just want you to imagine uh, the YMCA right here in Mount Clemens is holding a tournament, and they come to you and they say, um, so it's going to be a bunch of local teams in this tournament, just a bunch of uh, people over the hill, a bunch of people with beer guts, a bunch of people that peaked in high school, like, and, and you have the ability to build a team from anyone, any player in all of history, dead, alive, doesn't matter, past, present, future, any professional basketball player, and you can play against these, uh, these regular locals. Um, so, like, if it was you, so there's you, obviously you on the team, who else are we adding to the team? Get some crowd participation going. Steph Curry. Okay, who else? Kareem. Thank you. Why did it take so long to say the GOAT? Jordan. And if anyone has an, any argument with that, I have an entire theological thing I can lay out for you of why Michael Jordan's the GOAT. Not a big deal. 
So, so we had, so we had Steph Curry. We have Michael Jordan. Uh, what was the other one? Oh, Kareem. Kareem. Let's just, hey, let's just leave it at four. If there's five, you're gonna, de- you're already gonna demolish every team with, with, with two people. You're gonna demolish every team. My guess is, if you went into the gym. There, there isn't going to be any nerves. Like, the only nerves are going to be of the other team. Like, if that was me, like, I'm not even that great at basketball. I don't even like basketball that much. But if I knew I had Steph Curry, Michael Jordan, and Kareem on my team, I'm going in with a little bit of, a little bit of swagger. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because there is no idea or thought in your mind that you're going to lose because you're not, because you have the dream team. Can I tell you, the same is true in walking in victory in your relationship with Jesus. Friends, you have the dream team on your side, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this Trinity, this God is on your side, working on your behalf. Well, why would we ever be nervous? Why would we ever fear? Why would we? We should be walking through life with just a teensy little bit of Holy Spirit swagger because we know we are on the winning team. Can I remind you, friends, the game is rigged. I've read the back of the book, Satan loses. The game is fixed. If God is for you, who can be against you? Declaration number two, you can write this down if you're a note taker. Even if you're not a note taker, I want to encourage you to write it down. I'm not saying like you'll only go to heaven if you, if you write notes down, but why take a chance, right? So <laughs> declaration number two, you are chosen. You are chosen. This should be like a, an encouragement for your soul. This should, be little, should, should put a little stride in your step. When we're singing, get up out of that grave. Like you wonder what's like lifting me up off the ground when we're singing like these songs. It is truth like this, declarate, de- declarative statements like this. But it's not just me saying this. Verse 33 says this. Who will bring any charge against them, those whom God has chosen? This is massive. This is massive because the reality is Satan brings a lot of charges against us. Satan's going to try to bring up your past. Satan's going to try to bring up your past mistakes. Satan's going to try to bring up your past failure. Satan's going to try to bring up who you were in high school. And not in the lens or in light of all that God has done in you and the fact that you're not that person anymore. Satan's going to try to bring charge against you. But what is Paul getting at? He's saying it's null and void. It doesn't matter. Why? Because God has chosen you. Come on, say, I'm chosen. God picked you up out of the muck, out of the mire, and set your feet upon solid rock. Like, this is what I used to clap back at kids that would, um, that would be bullying me when I was younger because I was adopted. Like, I, I, I would, I would, I would kind of clap back at them. They'd always like, be like, huh, t- this is ridiculous, dude. You're black and your parents are white. I'm like, that's great detective work, Sherlock. But let me tell you something. Your parents were just stuck with you when you you came out of your mama. Like, your parents are just stuck with you. Mine chose me. Mine chose me, homie. And they're like, what? Like, they went to a store? And I'm like, yeah. I didn't know how adoption worked back then. So I just was, like, kind of spouting off information. But, But we're chosen. God chose us from the foundations of the universe. He peered through time. He didn't see you. Watch this. This is huge. He didn't see you on your best day. He didn't see you who you're going to be 10 years from now when he's perfected you more, when he's done more work in your life, and you're you're finally that Christian that you've always wanted to be. No, no, no. He peered through time and saw you at your worst. He saw you at your lowest. He saw you in your darkest season. And for whatever reason, he said, I want that. I want them. I want that person. Bruises and all, mess and all, and everywhere they're they're dirty and everything they they hate about themselves. I'm going to flip the script and turn it all around for my glory. Friends, you are chosen. Not only are you chosen this morning, but you are free. You are free. Verse 34 says this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Like, (laughs) okay, hold on. 
This is huge. This is like, you want to see me get excited? This is what gets me excited. Now, now let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 8, okay? We just read it briefly. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Warm blanket for their soul. Warm fuzzies. Jesus is awesome. But how? This piece of text gives us the how. Like, like, how is it that there's no condemnation? All my wrongdoing, all my sin. Like, okay, Jesus beat that. Like, it's covered in Christ. I'm, my, my life is hidden in Christ. That's all awesome. But how is he going to get this done? Because Jesus sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. For every single one of his children. Watch this. Jesus has God's ear. Jesus has God's ear, and he's sitting beside him on the throne, and he's talking to all of our daddies, and he's like, hey, hey, no, no, my blood covers it. No, 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 they're, no, 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 they're, they're good. They're good. They're good. No, my, my, no, my, blood, my, my blood, blood covers that. Like, have you ever had that sibling who, like, intercedes for you? Like, my, <laughs> my wife, Cece, used to talk about um, her sister, and um, she was, like, the intercessor. And so if any, t- any time, uh, any time uh, Cece wanted to do something or get away with something, like, if she went to her parents, because she was the firstborn, she got the most rigid rules, right? That's just how it goes. Don't worry, Dave. I'm going to be careful about what I say. But she got, like, the most rigid rules. And so she would tell, she would say, like, she went to ask her parents for a cell phone one time, and they were like, no, you can't have a cell phone, they're evil, they're going to, like, make you, like, I don't know. Anyways, so they had, like, all this, this rule, like, you can't get a cell phone. So what did Cece do? She went to Catherine. She's like, mom and dad won't let me get a cell phone. And, and, and Catherine was like, well, let me talk to them. And I don't know what superpower Catherine has, but she just had this ability, her younger sister, to go to her parents. I don't know if she did a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if she took them out to lunch. I don't know what happened. But all of a sudden... They came back like a couple days later, and they're like, hey, Cece, we're getting you a cell phone. And then we figured out what happened. Then they said, oh, and we're going to get Catherine a cell phone. Catherine didn't want Cece to have a cell phone. Catherine wanted a cell phone. But that's not the point. Like, some people have this just weird, innate ability to be this go-between and be this intercessor. Friends, this is what Jesus is for us. This is what Jesus is for us. Jesus actually goes to God the Father to talk to God the Father about us. And did you know, did you know this is actually a picture of what Jesus is doing as he's hanging on the cross? Jesus was hung on a cross Nailed to a tree, spikes driven through his, his hands, driven through his feet. And the soldiers that did this, Jesus is hanging, preparing to die and breathe his last breath. And while he's hanging on the cross, he's interceding and he's saying, God, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They don't, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. And if Jesus is interceding even for enemies that likely would never say yes to him and choose him and become Christians. How much more does Jesus intercede for you, his child, his beloved, a son and daughter of the Most High God? You've been made and set free. And how dare we walk through life believing we're destined for defeat? How dare we walk through life spiritually with our heads hung low when we have this kind of hope that we can cling our existence to? Lastly, I want to remind us, God's love has got you. God's love has got you. I want you to say it personally to you. Say, God's love has got me. Say it with me. God's love has has got me. Come on, say it like you believe it. God's love has got me. When it feels like all is lost, God's love has got me. When all the political landscape looks like our country's gonna burn, God's love has got me. When our job is making us lose our minds, I don't even know why I took this job in the first place, God's love has got me. When we have pain in the inside that we can't even describe, God's love has got me. When our household isn't operating the way that we want it to, but in the meantime, God's love has got me. Maybe you're finishing college because it's too hard or too boring, but still, God's love has got me. Maybe you're a parent of someone finishing college or heading to college with absolutely no plan, and yet, God's love has got me. Or you're the parent that's trying to figure out how you're going to pay for college, and yet, God's love has got me. 
And when gas is $800 a gallon, God's love has got me. Amen? This declaration, friends, will change your life. I promise it will give you victory. You will become a conqueror who walks in victory. But Paul is going to up the ante, and he's going to say it this way in verse 37. No, in all things, you are more than conquerors. You're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And yet, so many of us struggle to believe that truth. So many of us struggle to believe the truth that we are more than conquerors. That God could could give us that kind of freedom, could allow us to walk in that kind of victory. Some of us, we know that God operates that way, but not for us. Because our, our struggle's unique. Our issue, our tension's unique. God, he sees my mess, and my mess is just different than everyone else's mess. No, you're more than a conqueror. Don't you understand that no part of your brokenness can separate you from a holy God. You can't out the cross of Christ this morning. There was a time early on when my wife Cece and I were dating where I just, I, I struggled in our relationship because um, in my head, like I assumed the person that I was dating would be absolutely obsessed with me. You know what I mean? But she wasn't. Like, she, she liked me, and then she loved me, but, like, she wasn't, like, obsessed with me. Like, I just want to spend all my time with you. Like, let, let, me, let me say it this way. Like, I thought, like, when we started dating, like, I envisioned in my head that we were going to have, like, the late-night talks. We're on the phone. It's like, no, you hang up first. No, you hang up. Okay, one, two, three. Why are you still on the phone? No, you need to hang up. But this is what it was like. No, you hang up. Hello? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> it's still like that, by the way. But <laughs> and so th- this changed some things for me because, because I had a preconceived idea because of my insecurity of what relationships should look like. I, I, never, I never felt good about where we were at when we were dating. And so I, I just like worked overtime to be like super boyfriend. But I made things weird, right? Like I would like just show up like right when she was done working, even like really late at night, she would be like get done with work and I'd show up and I'd be like have flowers and like how was work and all this stuff. But it, it wasn't just because I was like, I, I wanted to be the best boyfriend. I was just like so nervous. Like, hey, if we're not talking, we're probably, we're, we're probably getting driven apart and eventually she's just gonna leave. Like I had all of this in, security. And some of y'all are like, Pastor John, it looks like you have some like deep-seated issues. Uh, you don't know the half of it. Can I, can I remind you of something today? You don't have to do that in your relationship with Jesus. Jesus isn't going anywhere. In fact, Jesus is drawn to the hurting and the brokenhearted. Jesus is, is actually leans in as we lean in out of weakness and in our need for him. He actually leans in. He draws near to us. This is who Jesus is. And so as we feel like there is this lack of communication, we don't have to fear a God that's going to be giving up on us and like, sorry, I'm going to look elsewhere. I'm going to look for a better suitor. No, no, the Jesus, our superhero, our savior of the universe. No, he looks to us with hope. He looks to us with desire. He looks to us and says we're valuable, and he seeks to reach out to us, which is why verse 38, Paul ends this chapter saying this, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You know, I have people ask me all the time, how is it that you can preach this idea and this message that that people can't lose their salvation? How can you speak it with such confidence? Put simply, I can't read this text any other way. That we have a hope 
in Jesus, that we, when we are placed in the Father's hands and we say yes to Jesus, that there is no force in heaven or in hell that can remove us from the hands of God. As we close this morning, I wanted to tell you a story about my last week. I had an opportunity to preach at a youth camp just south of Toledo. And about the second day of camp, I had already preached maybe three or four times, and there was a high school student who came up to me, and I won't say his name because many of those students are even tuned in this morning, but he came up to me, and he, in the middle of a lunch hall, he started telling me a story. And he told me a story about how for about seven, eight years in a row, he would go away to a different kind of camp. It was almost like a Christian Boy Scouts type of camp. And every single year, he was groomed and assaulted by the director, the lead pastor of the camp. And he was telling me this, and then he was telling me how rough his current home life was, recently stabbed by his uncle that would affect his walking off and on. And he's telling me this in the middle of a lunchroom and completely unprepared to hear any of this. He says, I was a Christian. I, I love Jesus, and yet all of this stuff happened. I've told my parents only part of this story. They don't want me to go to counseling. They don't believe in it. I don't know what to do but I don't know if I can continue on in a relationship with this whole God thing. And so I'm just looking for help in some direction. Nothing really prepares you in these moments. You're never really ready for these conversations. What I'm forced to do as a pastor is to stick to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, in all honesty, I sometimes struggle to stick to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes, knowing, even knowing that it's the hope of everyone's soul, that maybe what they really need is just a hug. Maybe what they really need is to just be told that they're loved over and over and over. And yet, without the gospel, there is no power. And so, I opened my mouth to speak, trusting that the Holy Spirit was going to give me the words. And and I just said, it sounds like what happened to you is that ultimately some individuals exercised their free will and did something terrible and vile and evil. And it's something that ultimately Satan's trying to use to destroy you and definitely to destroy your relationship with God and your view of God. And he began to, to tear up and his, his forehead just starting to sweat and And I would say, just like Job in the Bible, Satan will use the worst adversity in our life to call into question God's goodness and God's character. But what if God never changed? What if God always loved you and always cared for you and, and always loved you deeply and this broke his heart at the deepest possible level and all he wants right now is to reach out to you? And he took a moment and we prayed and it was a couple days later at the same camp, he came up to me and he said, God has restored my soul. <clears throat> and he said, and he said, and you saved my life. He said, because at the end of this week, I was, if, if there wasn't a change in my heart or in my life, I was going to end my life. And nobody knew that. And he said, and I told my youth pastor everything that's happened, and he's going to mentor me. And I actually called my parents and gave them the full story, and they're going to get me in counseling. Now, I, I didn't save anyone's life. But the power and the truth of the gospel has the power to save everyone and the power to save anyone. But I want to end with this idea. How could it? 
How could a transformation that would take many people years and years of counseling and therapy and processing and anger to come to a place of victory and, and conquering and acceptance, how can that happen in a couple of days? By no other way than the Holy Spirit opening up someone's heart in such a way and them responding to the Holy Spirit in such a way where they would open their heart and realize that God is for them and God has a plan and a purpose for them and that God has got them and that they are chosen and that they are free. And that's what he said to me. He says, I feel so light. I've been set free. I've been absolutely set free. And he was experiencing liberty in Jesus, even though he couldn't even fully articulate it. Now, how is that possible? Only by the power of God today. Can we bow our heads this morning as we close? What about you today? What about you today? What does God want to set you free from? What declaration do you need to declare over your life? Do you need to remember today that God is for you, that you are chosen, that you are free, that God has got you? I want to encourage you in these next few moments, declare it to him today. Declare it to him today. Remind yourself. Talk yourself into it. Maybe you need to remember for you. But as we close, I want to give an opportunity, maybe for the person that's in this space today downtown that's maybe as I've been talking, you've realized that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity, friend. The Bible says when you respond to what God is doing inwardly, when you say yes to him, it'll make all the difference. In fact, in 1 John, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God wants you. God wants all of you. God wants to heal and restore the broken thing in you and show you a brand new life. You can have a new walk with him today. So if, the, if that's you, you would say, that's me, Pastor John. I want to stop doing life on my own. I want to start walking with Jesus. All I'm going to ask you to do is on the count of three, just to lift your hand up in the air. Why do we do this? Because the Bible says, when you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. So do you want to walk with Jesus today? One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you, just lift your hand in the air. I want to walk with Jesus. Awesome, awesome. Anyone else? I see that hand. I see the hand. God sees it. God sees it. I see you in the back. It's the greatest decision you can ever make to walk with Jesus. Well, church family, as we close, let's pray this prayer out loud to support all those that are praying this prayer for the very first time. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church family. Let's celebrate with all those that made first-time decisions. For all of you that said yes to Jesus, I want to remind you, for the very first time, the Bible says that your name gets written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that there's angels that rejoice when even one prays that prayer. I want to say this from our church family to you. Welcome home. And there's so many different steps that you can take on this brand new relationship with Jesus. The biggest one is to just keep coming back to church because this is why the church exists. It's not a group of perfect people that have all their stuff figured out. No, we are a group of messed up, imperfect, broken people that are in desperate need of Jesus. Amen, church family. And so if that's you today, you're just like, man, I just need to figure my life out. I just need to figure out who Jesus is. Man, this is why church exists. There's so many different ways to get plugged in. We have small groups kicking off this fall. We have so many amazing events going on this summer that we want to tell you about. We have a, a baptism service. It's a great step for you coming in August. Uh, we're going to be baptizing people and uh, so many amazing things. Be sure to connect uh, to the church through the website. Uh, connect to the church family. If you want to get plugged in uh, more so, maybe you want to serve, you want to just be a part of something bigger than yourself, please reach out to us. Let us know. Even if you're tuned in online, you can fill out a digital connect card and, uh, and connect it that way as well. Well, church family, we pray for you every single week. And our prayer is the same, that the Lord would bless you and keep you 
cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you guys next Sunday, 10 a.m.